Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. We're in this series, It's a Fight. How many of y'all know it's a fight? It's a fight. And our guiding scripture is uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. How many of y'all know that's what this is all about? How many of y'all know this is an eternal relationship we have with God? It's not some temporary thing, you know. That's, that's kind of what I said when I got married. I had, you know, there were girls before Carol, but when Carol came along, there was a quick realization, and I mean very quick, that, uh-oh, this is the one. And I just remember us talking about it, and I remember sitting down in the office with her pastor and chatting with him and my pastor and um, all of the things that we we sat in their home before we got married in her pastor's home and he counseled us and gave us wisdom of 60 years of marriage and um, it was wonderful and I just remember saying but that for me I said this is forever Amen. just one wife one life right Amen. and uh, well I mean that's a you gotta it's, it's not easy um, it's been difficult but thank God <laughs> Thank God the Holy Spirit has worked on her. (laughs) Right? On both of us. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) By the way, all that story about Johnny getting smacked with a golf club. Yeah, sure. Just, you know, keep it at the house. (laughs) We work it out, you know. And, um. But this thing with God, and and I said to the pastor, I said, oh, hey, you don't even have to preach that message to me. My wife's parents had been married at that time 40-something years, and my mom and dad had been married 40-something years, 30-something years, whatever it was at that time. And I said, both of us come from homes that have worked on those commitments. And I said, you don't have to worry because this is forever. And uh, I, I heard the Lord say when I got saved, this is forever this is forever on his part is forever and if we'll stick to it amen and so uh, he said this is we're trying to lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses and so we've talked about this is we, this is a spiritual thing right God's a spirit they that worship him worship him in spirit and truth anybody remember what the the, the most powerful weapon was last week? My wife was listening. The Word of God, yes, the sword that I almost cut my foot off with. And uh, amen. And today, uh, I want to talk to you about, now last week was the most powerful weapon. Today may be the greatest. Today may be the greatest weapon that we have. And uh, I've entitled this message today, I Got You. I Got You. Y'all know what that means. I got you. We use it to say, it's a slang term. We use it to say, I understand you. I know where you're at. We say it when we, I know how you feel. And when somebody tells me something I've never felt before, I don't say that. I'll I'll say, well, I've never been where you are, and I'm not sure I feel what you feel, but I know someone who does. Amen. Amen. (laughs) And that's our high priest, Jesus. So we say, I got you. Today, I want you to know God got you. He's got you. He knows you. He knows everything about you. The Bible says he died. He gave his son to die for us while we were yet sinners. That don't tell you enough about God. I don't know what else to tell you. But he's got you. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24 says... A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. I asked the kids before church, I said, how many of y'all have friends? They all raised their hands. Pastor Bingo and I have talked about this. He said, when you get my age, if you got five friends, you're doing great. <laughs> and I'm not his age, and I tried to count, and I got to two, and I said, I understand. Amen. I like two friends in my life. And, uh, and the Bible, so I told the kids, I said, well, y'all all raised your hands. So that says to me, y'all are all friendly. Because the Bible says if you show yourself friendly, you'll have friends. So if, <laughs> I had someone recently tell me, 
wasn't Brother Bingle, so I'm not throwing you under the bus. But someone seriously told me recently, uh, right here in this building, said, I just don't have any friends. Well, I knew why. And I told him so. I said, well, I'm going to tell you why you don't have any friends. Because you're not nice. And you don't, you're not friendly. And I said, you know, here we are. We've we're, we're got all these people in the building, and you're saying you don't have any friends. But I know all these people. They're good friends. They're loving, caring, godly people. And all you got to do is show them a little bit of friendliness, and I guarantee you, you'll find a friend in this house. And so I said to the kids, yep, y'all must be friendly. Y'all have friends. But then Solomon says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Friends are good. Friends are important. Thank God for them. But he said there's a friend, talking about Jesus, that, is, that will stick closer to you than a brother. And he also said in chapter 17, verse 17, that a friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. Um, Micah used to say, I want a brother. I, I, want, I, want a bro I, want, I want you to have a brother because she had Macy. And then he said, but I, I want you to have another baby because I want a brother too. And he used to tell me what he was going to do with this brother when he got here. He said, We're, I'm going to teach him how to play baseball. I watched those two in the backyard hour after hour after hour of him throwing balls to Miles, teaching him how to catch, teaching him how to run. He, he's got a, Micah goes to a, a specialty coach, a, a pitching coach, and he's got him on a workout regimen. And, and as soon as he goes out the door to do his workout, here comes Miles after him, and he'll run with him. He walks backward with him. He does all those arm exercises with him. And I said, boy, when you wanted a brother, you got exactly what you wanted. I mean, I mean, they, and, and now, now they have squabbles. But they're brothers. And I, I, I'm just going to warn everybody. You need to warn your children about this. As they grow a little older, you better tell your kids, don't mess with Miles. Not because he's going to be so tough, but because he's got a brother. Y'all with me? My brother was real tough. He's four years younger than me. But he had a, four, he had a brother four years older than him. And if I was around, he was real tough. And then I had to take up the slack, you know. <laughs> you got beat up at church one night. <laughs> well, you know, it was a kid's meeting outside, and, and this kid had him against. I, I didn't know what was going on. I went in. We'd been playing football after it was like a recreation break, and I was, went in to get a drink of water, and this kid come running in and said, hey, your brother's outside getting killed. And I ran out the door, and a guy my age had my brother by his shirt and was bouncing his head off the brick wall in the front of the church. So being full of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I applied some anointing. <laughs> and then my dad got a call after church from the Lord. And he said, she said, she said, your son broke my son's braces, and you're going to pay for him. It's $3,000. And my dad said, okay. And he got off the phone. He said, did you just break somebody's braces? I said, yes, sir. I sure did. He said, why'd you do that? I said, because he had Billy by his shirt bouncing his head off a brick wall. And dad said, good job. Walked off. I just want you to know what a brother does. I've been mad at my brother. I wanted to break it. I've, I've wanted to put him against some brick walls. <laughs> but don't you do it. That's my brother. Right. I just want you to know the brother relationship. Yeah. You know, we used to say brother and sister around the church. I still do it. Uh, I call Sister Bingle, Sister Bingle, not because she's a nun, but because <laughs> that's what we always said around the church. Yeah. And now we've gotten away from that, and we've lost the value of brothers and sisters. We are family. And the Lord said, oh, I'm going to be a brother, I'm going to be a friend to you that's going to be closer than a brother. Amen. So brothers are born for adversity. I'm just giving you the scripture here. 
If brothers are born for adversity and he's going to be closer to you than a brother, then guess what? No matter what you get in, no matter how bad it is, no matter how rough it is, no matter how big the odds are against you, no matter what the struggle is, he's going to stick closer to you than a brother. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, in Honduras, they'd be shouting. <laughs> Job chapter 1. Uh, it says, one day, I'm reading now the New Living Translation. I don't usually do this, but, man, I like how this was worded. He says, one day, the members of the, of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, somebody say, the accuser. the accuser. That's the devil. He talks bad about you behind your back and even to your face. He'll tell you, you ain't nothing. The accuser, Satan, came with them. So, where have you come from, the Lord said to Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord, I mean, well, let me, let me tell you. You know why he has to watch? Because he can't read your thoughts. Satan only knows what you say and what you do. He can't, he can't read your thoughts. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't know what you're quietly praying under, you, you know, in your mind to God. He doesn't know your, what you're thinking. And so... He said, I've been watching everything that was going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and he stays away from evil. That's good right there. Stay away from evil. And Satan replied to the Lord. He said, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. You have put a wall all the way around him. I, I just want you to know that God has his hand on you because he's your brother and... He sticks closer to you than a brother. So he's doing, what you're, he's doing what your earthly brother cannot do. He's got you covered on all sides. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Now, I was about, let's see. I was about 17, 18 years old. Me and my brother found ourselves wearing our Channel View Letterman jackets in an enemy territory in Liberty, Te Dayton, Texas, to watch a girls volleyball game because we were interested in some girls. And um, so we went to watch them play volleyball and we made a wrong turn in a hall and we ended up in the boys football team dressing room as they were coming in off the field from practice. And we had already walked through the door and my first thought was, I'm gonna die. <laughs> and I told my brother, I, I grabbed him because he's quick on the trigger. And I said, hey, whatever happens, you just keep your mouth shut and keep walking. And as we started walking, they all started to realize we got two boys from the enemy school walking through our dressing room. And this big old boy stepped forward and he let out some nasty words about us. And my brother wheeled around and I looked around and we were literally surrounded by a football team. And I grabbed my brother and I said, look it. I told you to keep your mouth shut. I don't care what they say or what they do. We are walking out of here alive. And I literally drug him out of there. He said, why did you do that? I said, because we were surrounded by a football team. <laughs> you didn't think we were going to whoop 40 football players. He said, I wasn't worried about 40. I was worried about the one that mouthed off. I said, well, that's not how that would have went down, buddy. Thank God we got out of there. I know what it feels like to be surrounded. It's happened a couple of times in my life. 
actually three or four times in my life. I know what it is to be surrounded. Do you know what it is to be surrounded by the Lord this morning? And he didn't just say you're surrounded by me. Well, the King James says he put a hedge around you. But that translation lends to all those Christian comedians who make fun of butches. Well, y'all didn't ever hear it. Well, never mind. Yeah, yeah. Brother Lowry made that famous. He said, he said, look, why did God put bushes around us? Well, it's a bad translation. You're not surrounded by bushes. You're surrounded by a wall. You have a, the hand of God. The hand of God is upon you, and he has your front, he has your sides, and he has your back. He's got you. He's got you. Just take a good look at the breastplate of righteousness. We get the idea that it's some little thing on your chest. That's not what it is. It was two pieces hinged on one side. You put one arm in, they closed it and locked it. You're covered front and back and on your sides so you couldn't be pierced by a sword through your torso. Listen, God has a wall of protection around you, and Satan can't get through it. He can't touch you. <laughs> God only allows him to do what he allows him to do, and that's it. Amen. And Satan doesn't have the ability to do a thing about it. <laughs> Front, side, back. I went to Guatemala in 91. We were preaching it was during the rebellion, and, and uh, you know there was all kinds of stuff going on. And the day we got there, some missionaries had, had died, and... Um, and so we were there in a big group of people. We went to minister. And I told you all a few weeks ago, every morning, the, the, the missionary would have us put on the whole armor of God. And it becomes so real to me. It just become real. Like every day, we went through the motions of putting it on, you know, and, and putting on our helmet and grabbing our shield and our sword and going out to minister. And, and uh, I told you there was times we were in some sketchy places. And, and yet, I, I, I never was afraid. When I got back to the plant, I worked out the chemical plant. Uh, the, you know, Christians don't under, uh, non-Christians don't understand our behavior. And so back then, if it was in the news, what was going on there? And so everybody knew at work I'd gone there and going to be there 10 days. And so they were watching the news and they were seeing what was happening. And, and uh, so when I got back to work, one of the guys was sitting in the office one evening. And he said, man, dude, I was watching the news where you're going. He said, weren't you scared? I thought about it a minute. I said, you know what? I never was scared. He said, you weren't scared to die. I said, well, I'm not saying we couldn't have died there. I mean, people died there. You know, they're still dying there. I guess we could have. I said, but, but while I was there, I was not afraid. Because every day we put on the whole armor of God. And I said, I walked out. Uh, we were walking in a village one day. And the missionary told us, said, these, these thieves will hide behind the corners of buildings, and when you walk by, they'll attack you from behind. That's why we're putting on the whole armor of God. And you've got a breastplate on your back, and you've got a helmet on your head, and you don't have to worry. And I walked by a, a, a wall. There was two of the ladies were walking in front of me, and we walked by this wall. And as they walked by, I saw this man move, and he saw me, and he just went back. And I thought about it later. I said, he wanted to smack us over the head, but he couldn't do it. God wouldn't let him do it. And I told that brother, I said, no, I wasn't scared because every day we put on the whole armor of God and we were covered. Nobody could come up behind me and smack me on the head. Nobody could throw a dart through my back. Hallelujah. Put on the whole armor of God. Amen. So God has you. And he's got you surrounded, and it isn't, it's a wall that makes Jericho's wall look like a joke. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot penetrate the hand of God when it's on his people. Hallelujah. Yeah. So the second thing I want to tell you today about this is this. Two is better than one. Yeah. Man, I, I was so glad when my brother started to grow. <laughs> you know, when he hit about six foot, I said, okay, all right. Then when he hit 6'1", I was like, okay, you can stop now. I don't want you bigger than me. And then when he got to 6'3", I just gave up. And then 6'4", and 6'5", I was like, okay, you can stop any time now. I'm supposed to be the big brother. But I'll tell you one thing, two is better than one. You get a lot more respect when you're going into battle with your brother 
than when you go into battle by yourself. <laughs> Two guys challenged us to a basketball game. I said, y'all picked the wrong people. You won't stand a chance. I just remember getting the ball and going on a little fast break, passing the ball to my brother and watching him dunk it over this guy's head. And I remember thinking, he must have been thinking, I made a mistake challenging these guys. He probably looked at me and thought it's viable and didn't realize I got a brother. Sometimes Satan is so stupid. He doesn't, he's forgotten you got a brother. <laughs> Ecclesiastes uh, chapter, chapter 4, and I'm reading in verse number 7. Observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. Two people are better off than one. For they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer there, they are three, three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Oh my goodness. How many of y'all know God doesn't want you to live alone? It's been said no man is an island, but yet I'm living in a world now where everybody seems to be depressed and stressed out and dealing with anxiety and they can't go outside and they can't deal with people and they live in this total zone of fear of what might happen if I get out, if I do anything. Can I just tell you we're letting the weapon of fear do way too much damage to the kingdom of God. Faith is God's counteracting action to fear. We're supposed to believe God and trust God and not let fear stymie the kingdom of God and keep us from moving. Amen. So the Lord says, you don't need to be alone. Now, we've all had moments of loneliness. I was single for a few years and you know, before we got married, and that wasn't my favorite way to live. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it is depressing to be alone. And you know, to go home at night after work, you don't feel like cooking and because you know why? There's nobody to cook for. You're just feeding yourself. So you grab some Cheetos and a donut. It's fine. <laughs> Wash it down with Dr. Pepper and go to bed. Hallelujah. On a sugar high. <laughs> and, yeah. And I mean, you know, it is, you don't have anybody, so that's, that's what you do. And then, and then Carol comes along and everything changes because I'm not alone anymore. Now we eat donuts together at night. Glory to God. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. No, we don't do that. You can look at her and tell we don't eat donuts at night. Somebody might, but she don't. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I found out that, you know, I, 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 if, you've ever, if you've ever seen a good old sword fighting movie, I like old movies, you know. But one thing, there's no bad language in most of them. And, now, there's a lot of killing, but, but at least we don't have the bad language. And, and, and so I like old sword fight movies, and especially those old pirate movies, you know, where the pirates attack, and, and then it gets down to two guys, and they always have them back to back. And they're always the best at wielding the swords, you know. And when you got your back against your friend, you got one side. He's, there is no front and back then. There's only fronts. Y'all with me? And the victory is won because... We've now backed up. Nobody can hit me from behind while I'm dealing with this guy in the front. And that's what Ecclesiastes says here. God has got your back. He's got you. He's got you on every side, and he's got your back. The most, 
the most vulnerable part of a person in war is your back. And the Lord says, I got your back. I put my back to your back. <laughs> you don't have to worry. <laughs> my uncle and his was, all the men on my mama's side of the family are big like my brother. And uh, he was a big guy, very strong. All my uncles, all three of my uncles, my mom's brothers were that way. And my grandpa was huge, man. And uh, one night before my uncle got saved, he, he, his best friend was a bodybuilder in Boston. And now he's a state trooper. And uh, they had uh, their, their third friend that with, with them. The Bible says a three-fold cord is not easily broken. And the, thir the third person that went with them that night to go somewhere where they shouldn't have been um, was, was his friend named Norman. That's all I need to say about that, right? When I say Norman, you know what that means. You know, he's kind of a nerd. A little bitty guy, real thin, kind of frail. And they end up in this place, and they were, before Mike was a police officer, they were tricking people into arm wrestling my uncle. And what Mike would do, he's a big bodybuilder, he'd challenge a guy to arm wrestling for money, and then... He'd let him put him down. Like, wow, I just put down this big muscle guy. And he'd say, well, and then my uncle would act like he didn't even know him. And my uncle would step up there and say, oh, I'll arm wrestle. And the guy would be all pumped up. Well, I just beat that big old guy. I can beat this guy. And my, my uncle would say, yeah, but I'm not going to do it for that much money. I want more. And the guy, of course, would fall prey to it. And then my uncle would put him down. They'd take their money. Well, the little scam kind of went bad this night. And there was a bunch of guys together, four or five of them. And when my uncle put the guy down, the guy refused to pay. So the fight was on. And he said, I mean, that place went crazy. And he said, before I knew it, we were fighting six or eight, ten guys in that bar. And, uh, and he said, he said I, 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 all I remember thinking was, I just got to hit whatever's in front of me. You know? And he said, we were going at it. And he said, finally, the f in the, about three-fourths of the way through the fight, I remembered where is Norman? And he said, I just remember thinking while I was punching somebody, I bet Norman is in bad trouble. I bet Norman, he's probably, I hope he lives. And so when the smoke cleared and the cops came <laughs> and everything was over, he said, there was Norman. Not hardly a scratch on him. And he said, man, he said, what in the world happened? He said, well... He said, when all them punches started flying with those big guys, he said, I got knocked down by somebody. And while I was on the ground, I saw that this one guy was having his way with you. And I just went over and grabbed him by the leg and started biting him. <laughs> and he said, it worked so well, I just stayed on the ground biting people while y'all were fighting. I've always wished I had been there just to see it, you know, just to, not to do it, but to see it. <laughs> Mike and my uncle would laugh about that. Yeah, Norman was biting people on their shins and, you know, biting their calves while we were punching them in the face. <laughs> my uncle said, well, I was wondering why that one guy kept going, whoa, whoa. <laughs> And the, <laughs> sometime we're probably Norman in this deal. You know, you got God. He's, he's pfft, can't compare to God in this battle. And then you got your friend. And sometimes all we can do is just what we can do. But doesn't that encourage you this morning that you're not in this alone? And when you got a friend, that's one thing. But you add God in the mix. We can't lose this fight. It doesn't matter how many people were on the other side. It doesn't matter how many people jump in and gang up on us. Come on now. <laughs> uh, we get, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, Pastor, what should I do about this? I don't, I don't claim to be a, a, a counselor of any kind other than just experiential and knowing God and knowing the Bible. I I didn't go to college to learn how to be a psychologist or, you know, a certified counselor or anything like that. 
And, and yet, I, I feel like sometimes, you know, all you really need is just the Word of God, right? That's all you really need. And, uh, and I, I just, uh, maybe this morning is just a reminder to all of us. God is the answer. He's always the answer. He's always with us. He's always available. He, he's, he's right with you everywhere you go in every situation. It's kind of interesting that, you know, one of my uncles, my, now that was my uncle Robert. No, my uncle Roland was the uh, uh, same kind of guy, and, and he was in Gilly's Bar. And, and he, he said it was, a, it was an afternoon. He was a truck driver. He had stopped. That'll make you feel real safe. Um, he, he took his lunch break at Gilly's and was sitting at the bar before he got back on the street. And uh, he said, I ordered a whiskey and Coke. And the guy walked away. The bartender walked away to get it. And as he set that cup down in front of me, he said, God spoke to me and said, Roland Lee, what are you doing in here? He said, God called me at Gilly's Bar. Maybe we need to change how we do altar calls. <laughs> Work then. You know, God, God, you know God's, God's got your back when you don't even have his back. Right. <laughs> you know, when God called me, we don't need to talk about what went on that night. I just remember saying to the Lord, why are you calling me? A, he, he said, I want you to preach. That's how he called me. He said, I want you to preach. And I said, why are you calling me to preach? I don't even go to church. And the Lord said, I want you to preach. I said, but I'm not a Christian. I'm not living godly. He said, but I want you to preach. I said, but I don't read the Bible. Don't preachers need to read the Bible? He said, I want you to preach. He looked past everything I was saying to speak what he wanted me to be, which was to be a preacher. Oh, man, I didn't get no better than that right there this morning. That's what you should be doing in your situation. You speak what you believe it to be, not what it is. In 1939, World War II was breaking out, and Great Britain was in deep trouble. And they, what was fixing to happen was the Germans were going to start dropping bombs on them. They had already started, but they knew that it was headed in a bad direction. And it had just turned Europe into a, just a bastion of fear. And everybody was scared. Will this be the night when we go to bed? Will, be, will this be the night that our house gets hit? or our apartment complex, or our building, or whatever. Even bomb shelters, I mean, they had been bombed so much that even bomb shelters weren't that safe. And they, they said, will this be the night that our family gets, or will daddy get killed, or mama get killed, or the kids get killed? Well, there, we got people around us that's losing family members. They're dropping like flies every single night. And fear had just gripped that whole country. And Winston Churchill sat down with their... Uh, defense ministry team and they began to talk and they decided we've got to do something what can we do and they came up with a simple idea they said let's put let's print some posters and let's let's send them through the city could you could you put that up there and this was the first one they came up with keep calm and carry on. Now, that doesn't sound like much when you just say it. But when you say it and you put it in print and you send it out to every person in your country, you mail them to them and you keep doing it and you keep propagating it, keep calm and carry on. And these motivational posters literally turned the war of World War II. They, were, they had an intention about them. It was to raise the morale of the British public. And it worked. And they came up with more. They had one, just one of the guys on the ministry, defense ministry team came up with this idea. And this is what they put on the poster. 
your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. And your courage became a cry across that nation. Your courage, your courage, your courage, your courage, your courage. That's how we're going to do this. It's going to bring about victory. We're going to change our attitude, and we're going to be cheerful while they're bombing us every night. And we're going we're to be resolute about this. We're not going to quit. We're not going to just hide in bomb shelters. We're going to do something. We're going to move forward, and we're going to have victory. Well, you know the story. Uh, God's people have been in bondage for 400 years, and uh, it's awful. And uh, God raises up Moses. You know this whole story. And uh, they're building bricks for Pharaoh. That's what they do. They, they build bricks. They, 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 they don't have a, you know, they have these portable concrete factories they set up. They're out there taking clay and water and straw and mixing them by hand and putting them in molds and drying them in the sun and picking those heavy things up and dragging them around and stacking them and building. I mean, we're talking about hardcore manual labor. And it's been going on for generation after generation after generation. This is just what we do. We build bricks for Pharaoh. This is what we do. When I had my hay business in the middle of July, and we walked out, David and I were unloading a load of hay and uh, had 200 square bales to put in a container. I don't know if you've ever been in a container in July, but that's why people die when they come across the border hidden in containers. It, it, oh my goodness, it, it becomes an oven. And we could unload about 25 bales and I couldn't take any more. And we'd go in the air conditioner and cool off and get a drink. And we'd done that four or five times trying to get that 200 bales loaded. And we were sitting in there at the feed store taking a drink of water. And David looked over to me and he said, Dad, isn't there something we could do with a computer to make a living? <laughs> Them 13-year-olds, man, they're sharp. I'm just, you know. I said, uh, yeah, well, yeah, but I wasn't. I said, that's why you're going to college. <laughs> and guess what? In July, he's been making money sitting at a computer. <laughs> that's what he does. He's smarter than his daddy. And, uh, <laughs> and so this is where they are, man. They, you know. And you know about the, you know about all the plagues. You know the power. You know the staff that turns into a snake and eats the magician's sticks and stands back up and is a, well, turns back into a staff. And you know all that. And you know the water into blood. You know the, 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 the locusts. And you know the frogs. And then you know the, the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh says, get out of here. <laughs> and so they do. They don't get very far. Bible says one more time, <laughs> Pharaoh hardened his heart against God and said, Boy, I messed up. Why did I let those people go? Get the army together. Let's just go out there and end this thing, and we'll kill them out there in the desert. Let's just go catch up to them, and we will kill them. <laughs> How many of y'all know God's got your back? <laughs> And so they get to the Red Sea. Oh, my goodness. And we got a mountain on one side, a mountain on the other side, and a sea in front of them. And all of a sudden, they see the Egyptian army coming. And they start to murmur and complain. And Moses says, shut up. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he said, let me tell you all something. Exodus 14 and 13. It says, he told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. <laughs> now, that's, look at, look at, that's easy to read. Come on, don't get all judgmental. It's easy to read when you don't have an army on top of you fixing to kill you. They ain't smiling. And they're armed for, for bear. They're ready to kill everybody. And Moses just stands there, 
in the power of God. And he says, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. Winston Churchill said, we will send this to everybody and we're going to keep saying it because we're going to get to where we believe it. Let me tell you, that, that saying has become synonymous with the, with the country of Great Britain. You can go over here to Old Town Spring. We just did it a few weeks ago. You can go over there, and there's a little store. It's a British store. They sell, you know, they sell British original stuff. And you walk in there. There's not one. There's not two. There must be a 100 different cups designed with that saying on it, all the different emblems, all of it, but the same message because they believe over there this turned the war. And Moses did the exact same thing. He said, don't be afraid. You be still and watch what the Lord is about to do. So the Egyptian, to the Egyptians you see today, they won't ever be seen again. So the Lord himself will fight for you. Amen. Just stay calm. Amen. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. In other words, here's what God, let me translate for you again. He, here's what the Lord said. He said, you just told them that. I don't know what they're waiting for. Why are they still standing still? Tell them to get moving. Do you understand at that point, the water had not parted. The water had not parted. And the Lord said, why are they not moving? Why do they not believe? And then Moses turns and says, Beast, watch this. And he lifts up the staff and God parts the water. And you know the rest. They walk over on dry ground. God, behind them, God causes the pillar of fire to rise up and to block Pharaoh's chariots from coming until they can get across. <laughs> and once they were across, the pillar of fire went up. And Pharaoh said, well, if Moses can do it, so can we too. We'll just go between these miracle waters. I don't believe in this anyway. And the Bible says God calls the waters after they got in there in that dry bed. God calls the waters. The King James says he had assuaged the waters, but now he let them go. And it swallowed up Pharaoh's army and they were no more. Just like Moses said it would be. But it astounds me. God says, why are they not moving yet? <clears throat> why are they not moving yet? Why are they not doing something? Why are they not going? What do I have? Do I have to do it and then they believe? Or can, can they just believe? I wonder what would have happened. What would the story have been like if they would have just, as soon as Moses said it, if they said, let's go. We took the kids on a little road trip the other day, Micah and Macy and Miles. And, um, it wasn't all planned. The GPS controlled part of it. Um, misgu I call it the misguided system. Um, and I don't know why it is, but anytime you go to Austin, if you got your GPS on, when you turn to go back, it never takes you back the same way. And I know that. And so we had gone to Austin, and on the way, I told him, I said, we'll go to Bucky's. Well, that made the day. You know, we're going to go to Bucky's. So we made it to Waller. <laughs> and we stopped for breakfast. And then we drove a little further, and guess what? We found another little Bucky's. And we whipped in there, and we had ices at 10.30 in the morning. <laughs> and then we drove on, and we, we, we came out somewhere up there, I forget where, and there was a Bucky's on the left, but the traffic was real bad. And I couldn't get over there. I was pulling a trailer, and I couldn't get over there. I said, hey, we'll, we'll stop on the way back out. So we started to go out. The GPS sent us another direction. And we ended up at another Bucky's <laughs> on I-10. And then we ended up at another Bucky's. So four Bucky's. 
Miles was so excited about the fact that we've been to Four Bucky's, and he said, I don't know, when we started back, this is what he said to, he didn't say it to me, he knows better. He looked at his grandma and he says, Grammy, when we go to Bucky's again, you're going to buy me a beaver pillow and you're not going to say no. I don't know about y'all, but I can't say no to that. And I just said, you never know what's going to come out of that child. You're not going to say no. And so I said, well, he must have heard. Did he hear me say he was going to buy him something? And so we got the bug. He got, a, he got it. He saw it. He knew exactly what he wanted. I guess his mama's told him no several times. <laughs> and so he ain't forgot about it. So he grabbed the pillow. And we are walking towards the cash register. And you can't make this stuff up. You've got to be five to come up with this stuff. He's holding this pillow and he's loving on it while he's walking. And this is what he says out loud for everybody to hear it. I sure hope this isn't a dream. <laughs> Micah pinched him. Just so he know it wasn't a dream. I sure hope this isn't a dream. Now, surely, we, God's people, don't just think that God's just mouthing stuff because he wants a, you to have some dream that's never going to be fulfilled. Just look at God's reaction. Why are you still shouting at me, and why are they not moving? Well, let's just be honest, because we don't believe. Yeah, we saw the ten miracles. Yes, we saw that. We, we, we got all this Egyptian gold and silver and jewels, and yeah, we got out of there alive, but we forgot about all that. And surely we're just going to die right here at this Red Sea. And the Lord says, get moving. Tell the people to get moving. Stop shouting at me. Stop disbelieving and tell the people, get moving. And then Moses did his thing and God did his thing and they walked across dry ground. It is time for the church again to believe that I have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He's got my back, and whatever he says is going to happen, it's going to, it's going to be fulfilled. I don't care what the odds are. I don't care what just happened, but when God said it, all I'm supposed to do is believe it. Hallelujah. And if you'll just keep believing, you just know it's going to happen. Listen, let me give you some real-world stuff. If you're believing God for a house and, 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 and you think you got it, and you just be, you know, I'll just tell you our experience. When we moved here, we spent 12 months looking at houses every weekend, driving up in this area. And every single time that I said, this is it, we got one bought, it's going to happen. It would fall apart and it wouldn't happen. I was so frustrated and so upset. And I kept thinking, what in the world? And the day we got our house, we did not go to look at our house. We went to look at a, another house. We drove up in the driveway and my wife will tell you, we didn't even open the doors of the truck. We pulled up in that driveway, and I said, oh, my goodness. We were deaf in a swamp. Now, I ain't the smartest guy in the world, but my dad used to say, if you drive up to a house and it has yopon bushes in the yard, you probably shouldn't buy it. My dad was smart. There was a rice field in Dayton. I remember we used to drive by it all the time. And then this developer came in and bought the rice fields and started building houses. And my dad would slow down when we'd be driving through there. And he would say to us, I'm going to tell you, boys, something. That right there is the stupidest builder in America. And the people that buy those houses are dumber than him. Let me tell you something. This is a true story. You can drive through that place now, and those big, beautiful houses that they built out there, they look like garbage. And people have moved out of there right and left because they built it in an old rice paddy. Yeah. And, we, and we drove up in that yard, and I said, oh, my word. 
I cannot believe we drove down here. This is a swamp. Look at the yopon bushes. Look at the, look at the water line on the house, three feet up the house. I said, that thing's been flooded. Oh, my goodness. And we backed up to leave, drove up the road, up the hill, and there sat our house that God had prepared for us 12 months before when we started. I heard somebody preach something recently. God knows the end before the beginning. And we always get caught up in the weeds of the in-between, the beginning and the end, thinking God has left me. God's not with me. God's not going to make it happen. So then we buy the house, long story, and the guy not only hands us the keys to the house before we sign the papers, he says, it's yours, preacher. God told me, it's yours. you gotta, you got to have it. I said, dude, we don't have any contract. We have nothing. He said, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what God said. I want you all to take that, and I know God will work it out, and we'll, it'll be fine, and you'll buy it. Oh, by the way, here's the keys to my van it's paid for here's the title i've already signed it over in your name oh by the way the Kubota tractor is sitting in the garage and all those tools in that shop out there they belong to you i said wait wait time out did you leave the 69 z28 in there too that and then i found out you know eight years later javiel knows that car he wanted that car was i right in wanting that car amen he said, well, I would give you that. He said, Pastor, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'd give you that car. He said, but my ex-wife has got a lawyer, and they're coming to get it. I said, but I have the keys, right? <laughs> he said, yep. And I said, well, I'm locking the door, Jack. <laughs> well, they got in the barn, and they took the car. But anyway, and he said, oh, by the way, the little house behind, that's all furnished. He said, that furniture's y'all's. And when we get done, everything we leave inside the house. I said, wait, 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 wait. He said, no, I'm serious, man. This is just what we're doing. About two years later, we didn't want any of that furniture. We didn't want a lot of that stuff. Some of those tools he left, I didn't need. I've got to, I got to, I'm tool poor. And, and so we sold stuff right and left. And, and after two years, my mom said, um, hey, do you, know how, do you know how much money you have made on selling stuff around here? I said, no. She said, well, I do. I have wrote it down. Every time you've sold something, I wrote it down, and I just added it up. Do you want to know how much money you've gotten so far? I said, sure. How much? $26,000. I said, Carol, what did you do with that money? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I just told you all the other day, some little boy, could have a pillow, um, knocked the, took a baseball, well, knocked the main water line off the back of our house. So we had a fountain <laughs> blowing in the backyard. I run out there and turn the water off, turn the well off, blah, blah, blah. Go in the shop, dig through a box. The guy left us eight years ago when he moved out. Inside the box was every single piece I needed to cut that out, rebuild it, and turn the water back on. And that didn't just, that just didn't happen that time. That has happened, oh, my wife's shaking her head. That has happened over and over and over again since we got that house. Now listen, I was upset for 12 months, but I wasn't like these guys. And when I saw God do it, I didn't still keep hollering at God because I figured it out. It's better to wait on God. I just heard this. It's better to wait on God <laughs> because he's got your back. That's all, he, that's all they needed to know in that moment. God has our back. God is watching over us. Let's just keep moving. Well, we don't have, we're, we're, we, if we start marching, we're going to be at the, right, right, look it. I got to quit. This ain't Honduras, so you can't preach like three or four hours. They, they quit. They, they, they give up on you. I preach in Guatemala. It'll ruin you. You know, they just, preach more, preach more. I, I love these people. Yeah. Come to America, not so much. <clears throat> there has to be a point. Peter, get out of the boat. 
can't do that no more. <laughs> Bob was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Get out of the boat. But get this, if Peter would have never stepped, he would have never walked on water. What would have happened if they would have just started marching? I believe I know what would have happened. I believe the very same thing would have happened, but Moses wouldn't have had to lift a rod. There wouldn't have had this bi there wouldn't have to be no big spectacle. All you had to do is just keep marching and keep believing. Well, we're at the Red Sea. Don't worry about the Red Sea. Just keep marching. Amen. Just keep marching. I believe they'd have got there, and when they stuck their foot down, they would have found there wasn't water anymore. It was dry ground. And they would have walked on dry ground just like they did anyway. Because God said, just trust me, just believe me, just stop hollering, stop doing, and just do, just keep moving, stop begging. Yeah. I noticed something about my brother. My brother's taught me a lot. Having my brother's taught me a lot. He's taught me a lot. You don't have to beg your brother to be your brother. He just is. He just is. He's my brother. <laughs> we can have our squabbles, and we did. And yet, when trouble comes, I didn't have to wonder, does my brother got my back? He got my back. He's got my back. I don't have to worry about it. Amen. Why in the world are we worried? Is God really going to show up? Yeah. Is God really going to do it again? Yeah. Is God really going to be there for me? Oh, church. Amen. He's right here. Amen. He's right Amen. here. He's right where you are. Amen. He's in the middle of your situation. Jesus. <laughs> He's with you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked around inside the fiery furnace, and they said, well, we thought we were alone, but we wasn't. And I don't feel any heat. Do you feel any heat? No, but we are in the middle of the flames. The people on the outside looked in and said, we threw three people in, but we see four people in there, and that fourth one looks like the Son of God. <laughs> That'll preach. Even the world knows the Son of God when they finally see him. And God just says, I'm here. I'm with you. I've never left you. I've never forsaken you. I went before you. I got here before you. He got to the house before we did, 12 months before. My wife said, you know, when you hear, when the man started telling us their personal story, God started putting that house, God began to get that house ready for us two years before when they were living in Alaska. God says, yeah, but I got a preacher that's going to come plant a church and he's going to need a house and he ain't going to really have enough money along the way to do everything he needs to do. So I need some supplies in that house. That's how God works. Father, this morning... I believe Amen. that you have never left us. Amen. You have never forsaken us. Amen. And I don't know if everybody in this room even knows it or understands it this morning, but you've gone before every one of us and you have begun to make a way for us where there didn't seem to be a way. And the waters may be, may, may be deep and it may be treacherous. But I believe this morning you're just telling us to step. Because when we step by faith, you're going to turn that water into dry ground. That, that, that fear that was upon us is going to be replaced with greater faith as we see you do what only you can do. Yes, life has thrown us some curves. Yes, some things haven't turned out like we hoped they would. We thought we were in for one thing, but we've been in for another. And yet, your word has never changed. And whatever you spoke to us, it's a done deal. We just don't know it yet. When you said, we're going to the other side, you really meant it. 
you're going to the other side. About 26 years ago, we were driving down the road as a family. We were on the road as evangelists, and the Lord began to talk to us. He had been talking to us about most of our life. We, we always believed in our heart that we were going to plant a church. And I just remember this conversation, and we're talking. David's about 13 years old, and we're, we're, we're just talking in the truck, and, and we're full-blown, full-time evangelists at the time. But we start talking, yeah. We're going to plant a church one day. God's put that in our heart. We're going to plant a church one day. And Rachel said something to the effect, oh, I know we are. I've always known we were going to have our own church. I've always known that because that's, that's who we are. We, we, we want to be, we want to build a church. And um, all I can tell you is those conversations like that have sustained Carol and I through a whole lot of rough waters to get to where we are today. <laughs> and now, when the opposition comes, I'm just like, I'm, I'm not freaking out. I'm not. I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to because I've watched God be faithful and take us through rough waters and storms and trials. You know, I laid, I laid, you know, in my house thinking I was going to die from COVID. I kept thinking, well, God, I guess, you know, someone else will take the church forward. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Are you going to heal me? <laughs> and God sent a seven-year-old boy over there to pray for me. <laughs> Build my faith back up. I said, man, I can't die now. Micah's believing God to heal me. Amen. I mean, we've been through physical attacks, financial attacks, um, issues, you name it. Typical pastoral stuff, you know. We've, <laughs> it's just, but I just, I've just, all along, I just keep saying, I'm, I'm not freaking out. I've watched God do too much. I've watched God do too much. I don't understand it all. I don't know why it has to be like this. I don't know why we can't just, one guy told me, so he came with us early, this, this man, this is what he said to me. He, he told me before he, we, before he even planted the church, he met with us at our house. You know, he's one of the first, the, one of the first people to come on board, about the first three or four. And, um, and, and he, he, was, he was wealthy. And he said, he said man, pastor, I, 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 you know, I just know this is gonna take off. And he didn't even he didn't even make the first meeting at the building when we got a building, because he asked me before. He said, "Have you gotten a sign yet?" And I said, "No, I don't, I don't have a sign." He said, "We can't have church without a sign." I said, "We can't." He said, "No, Pastor. How's anybody going to know you're there?" I said, "Brother, we're, we're not a church yet." If I put a sign up, people are going to pull in the parking lot and thinking they're coming to a church and we don't have a nursery, we don't have teachers, we don't have pews, we don't have anything. They're going to be standing in that little building going, where's the church? We got some things to do before we can do that. Never made a service at real church. Walked away. Said, well, you know, if you're not going to hang, this is his words, if you're not going to hang a shingle up, I'm leaving. I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, but we're not hanging a shingle up because that's not how you build the kingdom of God. We got to be ready. I need leaders. I need people full of the Holy Spirit. We got to be able to give people something when they get it. And it ain't going to be just donuts and coffee. Yeah. Yeah. We got to have something to give out. Yeah. So I don't understand all the struggles. And I don't, I don't know what, but I know what God does. God just keeps being God, and he just wants somebody to believe. And I don't know what your, your struggle is this morning. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. And I don't, I don't know, you know, you, you may feel like, well, man, this just isn't happening like I thought it was going to happen. Well, join the club. Join the club. Because it doesn't always happen like we thought it was going to happen. But if you just keep trusting God... 
keep believing.